Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, just a quick thank you to everybody who took the time to leave a review for us on iTunes and wherever else you listen to Hacking Humans. We asked and you delivered. Joe and I are overwhelmed at the outpouring of kind words from all of you. We do appreciate it, and it is one of the best ways you can help spread the word about our show. So thanks. Here's this week's show. If somebody wanted to gain access to the parents' devices, accounts, data, kids are a great target for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast. This is the show where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some fun stories to share this week, and later in the show, we'll have my interview with Frances Dewing. She's the CEO and co-founder of Rubica. They recently published a report on how crooks are accessing parents' mobile devices via apps that their kids load. Mm. But first, we've got a word from our sponsors at Know Before. Step right up and take a chance. Yes, you there. Give it a try and win one for your little friend there. Which were the most plausible subject lines in phishing emails? Don't be shy. Were they A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, or B, please read important message from HR, or C, a delivery attempt was made, or D, take me to your leader. Stay with us and we'll have the answer later, and it will come to you courtesy of our sponsors at Know Before, the security awareness experts who enable your employees to make smarter security decisions. Joe, we have got a little bit of follow-up before we get into our stories this week. We got uh, a note from a gentleman named Joe. He wrote in, he said, Dave, in the last two podcasts, you and Joe were discussing the Spoof Transition Assistance Program website. In the first conversation, Joe made the comment to the effect, I would like to check it out, but I'm not going to. Right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is good advice. This person writes in and he says, while most of the time I check potential phishing and malware sites with a sandboxed VM, it's a virtual machine, Right. uh, when I need a quick look, I use the site screenshot.guru, which allows me to view a .png image file of a website to help quickly determine if it's legit or not. If you visit one of those fake tech support pages, you'll know what it is immediately. And uh, we went and checked out screenshot.guru, and the person who sent this in also checked it out that uh, screenshot.guru checks out with a lot of uh, malware companies, right. so that it's legit. It's not, uh, yep. it's not trying to do anything on its own. And so basically, what happens here, Joe, with this screenshotting thing? First, I tried it with the website that's being referenced here, dodtap.com, which is not the right website. And fortunately, it says that that website's no longer available. So Mm. I'm I'm glad to hear that. I did try it with Google. And what it does is it goes out and it takes a screenshot of the website and then shows you the picture of it. Right. Which is... Pretty cool. Yeah. Because now I get an innocuous view of the website and see what it's up to. mm -hmm. And you load it in somebody else's machine. Exactly. (laughs) Now, this is also useful, uh, you know, if you need to take screenshots of websites. I think what this is originally designed for is being able to get a shot of the entire screen without having to scroll and patch together images of a website. So if you have a website that takes up more than one screen, right. it's a great way to grab a screen. that. But a side use of it is you can go uh, visit a website without actually having to run it on your own machine. Yep, that is pretty good. Yeah, screenshot.guru. So, Joe, thanks for sending that in to us. Seems like a useful tool. Well, my story this week, Joe, this comes from AARP. And uh, I have to say, as an aside, the last time I used an AARP uh, story, I got a lot of uh, heat about it. Yeah, and you keep doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hmm, right. Fool me once and all that kind of stuff. Uh, So, yes, I, I would just like to say for the record, I am not quite old enough to have an AARP membership. I am... Moments away from being old enough to have, to have an AARP membership, but not quite there yet. How old do you have to be? I, I believe 50 is when they start sending you stuff. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at any rate, AARP actually does a great job of, of alerting folks to scams and frauds. And of course, their focus is on older folks, retired people. Right. But uh, interesting bit of research they published here. This is an article called uh, Research Shows When Phone Scammers Are Most Likely to Succeed. It was written by Doug Shadell. He's from AARP. And they actually uh, reached out to our friends over at Social Engineer LLC, good old Chris Hadnagy. Oh, good. Had him on the show a few times. And his team called over 20,000 employees of their client companies, and they were posing as HR folks. 
And they successfully got through to, oh, just over 5,600 people. And they were able to get 53% of the people to hand over personal information, Hmm. like social security numbers or computer passwords or things like that. Wow. Yeah. Now, you got to think that Chris's team is going to be particularly good good at at this. Yeah. But still, over half, that's a high rate. But what this article points out that I think is interesting is that there are certain times of the day and certain times of the week where they are much more successful. Now, we talked about this last week with what they called Friday-Monday scams. Right. This is different from that. This is during the work week itself. Right. So what they found was that Monday morning is the hardest time to get someone to fall for a phone scam. Really? Only 29% of people took the bait. By Tuesday, more than twice as many people succumbed to the scam. Friday was when it peaked. (laughs) <laughs> right. I don't think this is too surprising that Friday afternoon, maybe you've had a long week, you're tired, your defenses are down. 65% of people gave away secure information huh. on a Friday afternoon. That's amazing. Yeah. And they also found that calls later in the day were more successful. If you call someone around five o'clock, quitting time, right. two in three respondents were duped at the end of the day. Huh. They just want to get out of here. They've spent a lot of time working. Right. And they're probably exhausted. That The fatigue probably has something to do with it. I suspect it does. Another interesting detail here, they found that women were better at scamming people than men were. A, hmm. a woman's voice uh, was more successful than a man's voice. That is an interesting finding. Yeah, it is. And and I know, uh, for example, I've, I know going way back, I remember research with the voice systems on aircraft, right. like jet planes and fighter jets and things like that. You know, when they have those emergency announcements to so the pilot, like, pull up, pull up, right. pull up, you know, they use women's voices because they found that the pilot's in the heat of the moment when they're in the chaos of something going wrong, they're more likely to follow a woman's voice. It's it's more likely to break through the noise, right. the, the mental noise, than a man's voice is. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And I don't know, I mean, correlation is not a causation, but it does seem to align with what they found here that yep. folks are uh, more likely to uh, fall victim to a woman trying to scam them than a man. I think this is an excellent opportunity for a psychology researcher out there to try to find out and quantify this. Hmm. Why this might be. Right. Why this might be. Yeah. All right. Well, the story is over on the AARP website, which I would again like to point out, I do not frequent at all. So, uh... <laughs> Sure you don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, what do you got for us this week, Joe? Dave, this week I want to talk about a kind of attack that is called credential stuffing. Okay. And we hear about this frequently. In fact, I hear you mention credential stuffing attacks on the cyber wire probably about once a week. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. something that's picking up in frequency. And basically what it is, it's the exploitation of a human behavior that I and many other security professionals have been talking about for years, and that's password reuse. Mm -hmm. And here's how it works. There's a data breach somewhere, and user IDs and hash passwords are stolen. Hopefully, they're hashed. Right. right? Right. There's no guarantee that they're hashed, but let's say they're hashed. And for those who don't understand what hashing means, just quickly, what is hashing is a way to obscure point, Dave. I'm making a password. Everybody understands. If I'm going to store a password, I have an option. I can put the password in plain text in the database. That's very bad. Right. Right. Or I can do something called hashing it, which is essentially a one-way encryption algorithm for purposes of passwords. It's it's more than that, but for the purposes of passwords, you can certainly think of it as a one-way encryption algorithm. I can take the password, I can hash it, I wind up with a hash digest. And the next time the user enters the password, I get the same hash digest and I know that the user has entered the correct password. So it's a way of protecting that password while you have it in storage. Correct. Right. So if it gets stolen, it's difficult to reverse engineer it. Okay. So these password hashes, when they get breached, they have to be cracked. Now that's another kind of technical term, but you can think of cracking as working the hash backwards. It's actually technically not working the hash backwards because that's part of the algorithm is that you should not be able to look at the hash and derive the password, but there's nothing that stops me from essentially brute forcing and guessing until I get Get the right result. Okay. Then I know what the password is. Okay. So that's what password cracking is. There's a, a lot of computational power available Correct. inexpensively these days. Correct. So being able to brute force these things is is not really an exotic thing to have it to be is able to not. do anymore. If you buy a GPU, like a modern GPU, you can crack passwords at an alarming rate. Okay. It's pretty powerful. So now the attacker has a username and password pair that gets them into some system. Right. But if this is your username and password, and you reuse your password on another site, Mm. 
you are vulnerable to a credential stuffing attack. This is where automation takes over. The attacker will take a bunch of these username and password pairs and run a script that attempts to log into a bunch of different systems out mm. there on the internet that, mm -hmm. they, that they have access to. If the login is successful, then the script tells the attacker that it found a valid pair and the system it found it for, right? So for example, let's say your website, Dave's website gets breached mm -hmm. and you get somebody's username, which is a Gmail address and their password. Right. And then that person has reused that password on Gmail. They run the script and one of the sites it attacks is Gmail and it says, this username and password pair is valid for the site Gmail. Right. We got a hot one. We got a hot one. Then the attacker can log in and take over the account, extract personal information or compromise an email address or whatever, whatever that system allows them to do. The attacker essentially has access to that system. Right. As the user. Okay. All right. Now, I know this sounds like it's not really a big problem, but it, it really is. Password reuse is a real problem. Earlier this year, Troy Hunt, who is a, uh, a researcher, security researcher, found something called Collection One, which was an aggregation of a bunch of breaches of email addresses and passwords. And he found that there were like 1.1 billion email addresses in here. Hmm. And, and a very large number of email password combinations. The fact that there were more email password combinations than there were email addresses indicates that this collection contains multiple passwords for some email addresses. If you couple that with the research from last year out of Virginia Tech that found that if you reuse passwords but slightly change them, they can guess your password in 10 guesses. So now I have an email address, two or three passwords, and an algorithm that will let me guess another 40 passwords for that user, and I can automate that and I can script it. It's a really good point. And I think we've all probably fallen victim to this at some point in our lives, in our in our journey in technology, where right. we think we're being clever by slightly varying a base password. Yes. You know, my password is Mickey Mouse 1, uh, and then for a different thing, I use Mickey Mouse 2, or, yep. or Mickey Mouse 1974, or, or something like that. That's right. And the point is, that does, doesn't work anymore. It, you it does not work do anymore. That, <laughs> that is not... The, the Not automation is smart enough to go through those combinations. That bit of cleverness that may have worked in the past right. is no longer valid. You can't use it. It won't work. This kind of stuff is is readily available to attackers who want to get out. They can go out and they can buy the tools. They can do it. Yeah, it's cheap. It's cheap. It's readily available. And actually, if they want to spend some time writing some Python code, they can do it in that too. It's yeah. it's it's easy. It's cheap and easy. Yeah. So what can people do? That's the question. Yeah. Right? Every every time I have this. Last week I didn't have much good news, but today I do have good news for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'll say it again, Dave. Use a password manager. Yeah. Use a password manager. Use a password manager. This will allow you to have a different password for each site that you visit. And those passwords can be long and complex. And so even if the, the hash does get breached, there's a much lower chance that it will get cracked, which protects you in two different ways. Use some form of multi-factor authentication. This will stop a credential stuffing attack in its tracks. If you have some kind of two-factor, even just a simple SMS, because a credential stuffing attack is a scripted attack. When the script sees that it's looking for a second factor, it's just going to stop and go, I can't crack this one. Because that requires a little bit more effort on the part of the attacker. They're going to have to go and social engineer their way into getting your, your SMS code or even the code off your RSA token or something else. That protects you immensely from these kind of attacks. And if you still don't believe this is a problem, you should go to Troy Hunt's website, haveibeenpwned.com, and see if your email is listed in any breaches. And I'll bet every listener a dollar that their email address is in this database. Oh, boy. Right. Uh, in order for this bet to be valid, all listeners must agree. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're really going out there. Boy, you're a risk taker, yeah, Joe. Yeah, that's right. But I'm really not, but I'm playing the numbers. Uh, yeah, game. okay. All right. But well, yeah, then, go on. <laughs> one more thing. If, if you feel up to it, you can check Troy's password site. He has a similar thing for email addresses. If you just look across the top, it says passwords, mm -hmm. and you can enter your password. And he has a, a document on how he says he's securing it. And I don't doubt that he's doing this. I think Troy has a real vested interest in, yeah. in doing this properly. Yeah. He's a legit, legit yeah. good actor. He's, yeah. Exactly. But you can see if your password is in any of his database. Now, years ago, I used to reuse passwords. You know, this was mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I still remember those passwords because they were kind of easy to remember. They're all in the database. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a uh, a different researcher call me up one time and read out to me a bunch of 
yeah. passwords from my past, yep. which is chilling and a good reminder that the way to go these days is let the password manager spin up a random string of letters and numbers, and you don't have to worry about remembering them. Right. The password manager does it for you, and you're just going to be so much better off. It just get over that hump of the transition of using a password manager. Uh, it is easier than you think it is, and once you start using it, believe me, you will wonder how you ever lived without it. That's correct. That's my my pitch for a password manager. And, and here's my pitch for how you do it. You just yeah. start using a password manager, and every time you log into a site for the first time since you started using it, you change your password. Yeah. You don't need to, to do the daunting task of going through every single account that you have and changing the passwords right away. I mean, some people might argue that you should, but I would argue that you should just use what works for you. And if that works for you, just taking the passwords in one at a time and doing this process as part of your normal life, that's easier for you to implement a more secure process. Do that. Yeah. And you know what? The, the password manager that I use, if I try to reuse a password or, or if I use a password that it recognizes as being used somewhere else, right. it pops up and warns me. Yes. And, it, and it says, hey, we noticed you're using this password somewhere else. Now would be a good time to change it. How about we do that together? <laughs> right. That's right? a good password manager. Yeah. No, it's great. So yeah, get out there and do it, folks. It's, it's an easy way, not expensive. It's just a better way to protect yourself. We're past the days of spinning up your own clever password. It's just- right. It's just not a good idea it anymore. can't be done. No. All right, Joe. Well, it's uh, time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes to us from a listener named Bennett. He sent us two audio files of phone voicemails he received recently. <laughs> These are fun ones. So let's just dig into it. The first file sounds like this. This call is from the Department of Social Security Administration. The reason you have received this phone call from our department is to inform you that we just suspend your social security number because we found some suspicious activity. So if you want to know about this case, just press one. Thank you. Oh, you better press one, Dave. (laughs) (laughs) Just slam your finger down on that one button. Department of Social Security Administration. Yes. And we've suspended your social security number. No, no, we suspend. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Please call. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's hilarious. Right. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, can your, I don't even know what that means. Can your, your social security number can't be suspended. Yeah, maybe it can be. Maybe Dave, your and, account. I don't, I have. How do, I, how do you, uh, how do you then apply for credit? Uh, you can't suspend a social security uh, number. That's one of the problems with the social security <laughs> number is you, it's immutable. Madness. Right. Yeah. As if that's bad enough. Here's another one that uh, Bennett sent in to us goes like this. This information would be considered an intentional attempt to avoid initial appearance before the magistrate judge or exempt jury for a federal criminal offense, which is against your name. Your case ID is CP 98898. For more information on your case, you can contact the Tax and Crime Unit on our number that is 202-858-9627. I repeat 202-858- Nine six two seven. We would be glad to share your case in front. Yeah. So yeah. it's a sliver. It's not all there, but I think we've heard everything we need to hear. Right. Uh, and it'll, to our earlier point, it's a woman's voice. Right. I don't know. I, I felt more motivated to respond. Did yes, you, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Um, a, a criminal case against us. That's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Obviously synthesized, yeah, not, not gonna, a real person. Yeah, I think that's probably because it's coming from a foreign country and a lot of these actors have realized that their accent is maybe a giveaway. Mm-hmm. So they're they're doing this to prevent that from being the case. Yeah. Again, if somebody, some law enforcement agency has a warrant out for you, <laughs> like a failure to appear warrant, like this thing says, mm-hmm. they're not going to call you. No, they're not going <laughs> to warn you. They're not going to, not going to give you a heads up. They're going to show up. Yeah. And they're going to, they're going to bring friends. Right. They're going <laughs> to knock on your door <laughs> and knock through your door. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're not going to tell you that they're coming. So right. you receive something like this. Uh, best thing to do is just hang up and is ignore to, it. Yeah, ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. Something, if it gets to this point, you'll know it by other means. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks to Bennett for sending this in. Uh, these are unfortunately becoming much more common. And uh, I, I know I get them phew, probably once a week, I, if not more. I don't get them very often. Is actually. that right? Yeah. Hmm. I I'd actually, I don't answer the call. I have my Google Pixel 3, which has this call screening feature. Mm. And I use that a lot. Okay. 
And uh, actually, since I've started using that, I've noticed that I don't get as many spam calls. Hmm. All right. Well, that's good to know. All right. Well, that is our catch of the day, Joe. Uh, coming up next, we'll have my interview with Frances Dewing. She is the CEO and co-founder of Rubica. They recently published a report on how bad guys are accessing parents' mobile devices via the apps that their kids load. But before we get to that, we've got a word from our sponsors, Know Before. And what about the biggest, tastiest piece of fish bait out there? If you said, A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, you've just swallowed a Nigerian prince scam, but most people don't. If you chose door B, please read important message from HR. Well, you're getting warmer, but that one was only number 10 on the list. But pat yourself on the back if you picked C, a delivery attempt was made. That one, according to the experts at Know Before, was the number one come on for spam email in the first quarter of 2018. What's that? You picked D, take me to your leader? No, sorry, that's what space aliens say. But it's unlikely you'll need that one unless you're doing the day the earth stood still at a local dinner theater. If you want to stay on top of phishing's twists and turns, the new school security awareness training from our sponsors at Know Before can help. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com, slash fish test. And we are back. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Frances Dewing. She is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Rubica. And they recently published an interesting report on how the bad guys are using parents' mobile devices to get information via the apps that they load up for their kids. Here's my conversation with Francis Dewing. As a parent myself, I have to admit, I don't know how parents parented without iPads and iPhones. And parents are just people in general. I think the statistic is we spend 80% of our online activity is on mobile devices now. And we know that it's very common for parents to, you know, let's say you're in a restaurant, you maybe hand your device over to your kids to entertain themselves for a while or on a long car trip giving them the iPad in the back seat. And there's really nothing wrong with that. It's just that I think, you know, a lot of us use devices in the internet uh, without completely understanding how all of that is working and all the interrelated pieces and what vulnerabilities can lie there. So the purpose of our study and part of uh, uh, what we do at Rubica just consistently is to try and highlight these things for consumers so that parents can make good decisions about what they're allowing their kids to do online. Because I think it's it's well-intentioned, but you don't know what you don't know, right? So we're trying to highlight things that sometimes are hiding in plain sight that people don't know to look for. Let's walk through it together then. What are some of the risks when I hand over that iPad or that mobile phone to my kid to, to help fill the time? What are some of the potential risks there? So what we specifically looked at were free games marketed to kids under 12. So these are games rated E for everyone, not teen rated games. Hmm. And the reason why we looked at games for young kids, number one, was is because we know that kids and parents share devices. 70% or more of kids under 12 have shared a device with another family member. They don't hmm. usually get their own device until they're around 10, 11, or 12. And the reason we wanted to look at that is that if there is a vulnerability in an activity that your child is taking, if that's on your device that you also use for work or for email or for banking, that becomes a much bigger cybersecurity issue for you as a parent or as your, for, for your family. So we looked at games for young kids uh, and we looked at free games specifically because of the advertising that's in free games and this nebulous, we'll say, relationship between app developers and third-party advertisers and the kinds of information and things that are exchanged in that ecosystem. With free games, almost every free game has either an in-app purchase or upgrade option or uh, advertisements or both. And the to kind of summarize the issue with advertisements is that many of them in these games for kids advertise other applications. So it'll be an advertisement for another game that you're then prompted to download after you watch the ad. And it's those secondary games that are advertised that we found the most security issues with. Hmm. Let's walk through this. I set up this free game for my son or daughter to play and something pops up while they're playing the game and then that prompts them to do what? 
during the game exactly while they're playing the game that ads can be as frequent as every two to three minutes we mm -hmm. found in certain games. And these oftentimes these are popping up and they are re required to click before they can continue gameplay. So if you imagine a young child playing, you know, if they just want to keep playing the game, they're going to click on anything right. <laughs> and everything. Right. And sometimes the, the advertisements also are deceptive in terms of using enticements like click here for free coins or for a free life or collect your free prize. And young children don't know how to differentiate between those ads and the game that it, it oftentimes looks like part of the game still. So, but yes, you're correct. What will happen is they'll click and it will be an advertisement or some sort of a demo or prompt for another game. And then it culminates with saying, try this game, download this game. And oftentimes it'll even redirect you to the app store with a big button in your face to click and download this other game. And so is that where the real danger lies then that we're we're sort of, I don't know, our kids are sideloading an app without us knowing and it's that secondary app that has the security issues? Yeah, what we found was some of the primary popular apps that we started with testing initially had some, I would say, overreaching permissions uh, that are invasive to privacy. So for example, uh, we found games that had access to see all the list of all the other running applications on your device and position prompts over them. There are some legitimate uses for these permissions, but the problem is that there's also nefarious uses for permissions like that. So for example, that particular permission, if I can see the list of all the other apps you have on your device, I can see that you have a certain banking app and that you bank with a certain provider. And I could even position a prompt over that as a fake login screen. So I'm not I'm not saying that these primary games are doing that, but they could. But most of those privacy security concerns we found were not in the primary apps, they were in the secondary applications. And a lot of what's going on here is that the advertising networks that are deciding which ads to show in the games, there's a lot of subcontracting that happens in that chain it can be easy to exploit that ecosystem and serve up an advertisement for an app that is malicious. And I guess that makes it harder to track these sorts of things down because uh, my kid and your kid could be playing the same game, but different ads could be put in front of us and some of them could be benign and some of them not so much. Right. And, you know, the problem is that they can kind of hide in plain sight under this facade of legitimacy. The applications that we were prompted to download were all available in the official Android and Apple stores. So these are not, you know, rogue apps sitting out on a random website. These are apps that made it through the review process with Apple and Google and are sitting in their stores. And the problem is that, like I said, there are some legitimate uses for these permissions. They're not per se evil on their face. But when you stop and think, for example, we were prompted to download a puzzle game that frankly was a really looked like a really bad version of Tetris, like it was made in the 90s by a five-year-old. <laughs> and the game was very simplistic, had no other kind of functionality or in-app advertising. So you kind of wonder what its revenue stream is. When you look at the permissions of that puzzle game, it had access to your contacts. It had access to your precise GPS location. It could send emails without notifying you, without your knowledge. And you have to ask, why would a puzzle game need that? Right. And it's it was built by an obscure no-name developer with a random Gmail address, kind of very sketchy kind of paper trail, basically. So you're right that the problem is that, you know, these games, if you're looking at them as, as a parent, I think it's easy to say, you know, if your kid comes to you and says, mom, can I download this puzzle game? You look at it and you think, okay, well, it's not inappropriate. You know, it's just a puzzle game. Seems fine. Go ahead. Because parents don't know to look at the permissions. They would never expect that these apps are gaining those types of permissions on their devices. So what are your recommendations? How do we better control these things to protect ourselves and our kids? Yeah, I think 
you know, there's a kind of bigger ecosystem problem that I think a number of different entities need to be held over the fire to be a little more accountable with this. But in the meantime, what we can do as parents is, number one, use parental controls. If you have parental controls enabled, that will prevent your child from being able to download that secondary application without your permission and your password. But I caveat that with make sure that that's a password your kid doesn't know. And I don't, you know, you can't underestimate their adeptness at figuring out your passwords. Yes, Uh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) And then secondly, you know, don't assume an app is safe just because it appears to be an, an innocuous kids game. Check the permissions and really just think, you know, use common sense. Think about, does this game need that access? And if it doesn't, either don't allow it or choose another game. With what's at stake, with the amount of information that we have on our devices, maybe the best investment is to get your kid their own device so it's not on the same device where you have the keys to the kingdom. Yes. I think if that is an option for your family, I absolutely would recommend that. That kind of cross-infection, you know, this is not something theoretical. We know that cyber criminals target kids as an entry point into their parents. And actually, the former head of a very elite division of the NSA, um, his name's Rob Joyce, a couple years back, he gave an interview with Wired Magazine where he indicated that one of the favorite attack vectors of nation states is when employees let their kids download games on their devices and then take those same devices back into work. So the same holds true in our personal lives. You know, if somebody wanted to gain access to the parents' devices, accounts, data, kids are a great target for that. If you can separate that out and give your kids their own iPad or, you know, tablet, that is an excellent choice. Joe, some interesting stuff, huh? Yeah. I'll tell you how we parented without iPhones or iPads. Oh, boy. (laughs) (sighs) Yes, Joe? (laughs) Uh, We just didn't have iPhones or iPads and made do. I mean... (laughs) Yeah, we all had sing-alongs in the car while we were driving on our family that. vacations. Yeah, yeah, that was right, fun. Right, right. Yeah, we had the kids' music and they loved it. We'd mm-hmm. talk, you know, or, or our, our kids would read books. Uh, um, like animals, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That was always good. Yeah. I want to reference back in 2013, there was a Smurf app, like some Smurf movie was coming out, mm-hmm. and there was an app that came out with it that was charging parents huge amounts of money based on what their kids did. One parent was charged 4,000 pounds over five months Mm. with in-app purchases (laughs) for kids. When you're looking at permissions, no eight-year-old is going to read, let alone understand what they're looking at in the permissions dialogue that the operating system will display. A a lot of adults don't do it properly. of course not. So an eight-year-old is not going to do it properly. No, it's absurd. Finding that advertising is deceptive, I'm shocked, Dave. (laughs) Shocked. (laughs) And finally, the story of the app that reaches into your contacts and gets all the information out. It's not an uncommon thing. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if I ever told this story, but back in 2010, I was on a job hunt and I got a call from somebody who was looking to do just this in, a, in an Apple app. Hmm. And they were looking to try to extract this and, and then report it up. And I was like, I'm not really interested in that job. <laughs> it's, right, right. it's one of two jobs that I've essentially told people I've that come to my mind that I'm just not interested in working mm-hmm. for you. I remember similarly, this wasn't an, an, an online thing, but I got a letter in the mail once from a company whose business model was basically getting us to send them our entire contacts list, which they would pay us for, you know, rat out. Rat out your friends. <laughs> rat out all of our friends and contacts. <laughs> right. Yeah. And for, a, you know, they'd give us some sort of flat fee so they could put it into their database that they would turn around and sell. We, right. uh, we actually pinned that one to the uh, bulletin board, I think, as uh, things we will not do. Right. So. Yeah. Somebody did it. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Somebody did it. Yeah. Somebody took the 20 bucks. Yeah. Well, again, thanks to uh, Francis Dewing for joining us. Uh, Lots of good information and lots of stuff to think about before you you toss that mobile device to your kid to to get them to pipe down and, you know, (laughs) mind their business while you're uh, someplace where you want them to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe take a moment to think about how are those apps getting loaded and what, what else is on that device. Yep. So thanks to her for joining us. And of course, thanks to all of you for listening. And we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure you take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. 
We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more about them at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilby. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thank you.